Hi guys. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and start with chapter five lecture notes. So let me see if I can go find those real quick and we can get started. Aww. I hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to the week. I hope everybody's good. Um, there we go. And so chapter five is all about bank reconciliations and cash. So specifically, we're going to talk about the idea of internal controls first. And so internal controls are rules that we put into place to keep our assets safe. So when I say keep our assets safe, what I'm referring to is making sure that our items don't get stolen from us as a business. And so I personally, I believe in the good of all people. And I don't believe that our, our employees are going to steal from us, but I also know that I want to remove temptation. So when I say remove temptation, I really want to be careful and make sure that I'm not tempting them to be able to do unethical things. So our five internal controls fall into basically five categories. The first one, like five control responsibilities, so um, is restrict access. So one of the main ways that we keep control over our assets and keeping them safe is to restrict access. So a good example of that is a cash register. If our customers came up and paid their bills and they just gave us money and we just threw it in a pile and then we pulled money out and gave them change like I do during a garage sale, um, like I keep it in my purse, but like I'm just like pulling out bills and giving them change, um, it would be a lot harder to keep um, our cash safe. And so a cash register is an idea for restricting access or locking things and things like that. Um, document procedures are basically just saying that we use some type of numbered document to keep um, our items accounted for. And so this is an internal control procedure. So as an example, I worked at a heating and air conditioning place um, the summer of my freshman year of college. And I would give I would answer the phone and be like, hey, what up? And they would say, hi, my air conditioner is not working. And I would make a work ticket. And then I had 14 different repair guys and I would schedule their work and give them the tickets. So I would always, I would give them numbered tickets. And then at the end of the day, they would all bring the numbered tickets back to me. And then I would bill the customers based on whatever repair work they did. And because they were numbered, it helped me keep track to make sure that one of them didn't go missing. Because if one of them went missing, we either didn't go help a customer or we went and helped a customer and the guys didn't bring the ticket back and then I would forget to bill them. So it was an important uh, procedure. Um, all right, another one. I think established responsibility is actually one of them. Oh, you guys, this blank is an internal controls. I've lost my mind. It's segregation of duties. Now you're going to have to either erase it or go back. I was like, I was thinking that something was wrong and I couldn't figure out what. Okay, first one, establish responsibility. This is giving tasks to specific people. So as an example, um, only certain people should approve purchase orders. And that's to make sure that the items that are being purchased are proper and making sure that people aren't ordering stuff for themselves. Segregation of duties is actually the main control procedure that we as accountants focus on, it seems like. So segregation of duties is making sure that one person doesn't have too much control. So specifically what I'm looking at with segregation of duties is things like telling, um, like having one person order goods, somebody else receive goods, and somebody else pay for goods. Because if I am able to order goods, receive goods, and pay for goods, then I can just order stuff for myself and take it home with me and then just not mention it to anybody. And so at the heating and air conditioning place, I could just buy an air conditioner for myself and then I'd receive it and then I would take it home and then I would have the company pay for it. But if different people are ordering, receiving, and paying for the goods, then we're able to check and double check and make sure that unethical things aren't happening. Okay, so back down here, this bottom one is independent verification. And independent verification is when we have someone unrelated to the process come in and make sure that um, things are okay. So as an example, at the heating and air conditioning place where I worked, um, I would do a lot of the day-to-day -day accounting stuff but then someone else came in and did a bank rack and they looked at all the transactions and make sure that, you know, all the deposits cleared and all that kind of stuff to make sure that I didn't steal anything. 
Now, to be real honest, I could have stolen everything from that company because they did not have good internal controls in place. But because they hired an ethical employee, they didn't have to worry about it so much. So when you're a small business and one person does lots of different tasks, you have to be very careful to make sure that person is making ethical decisions. And so um, you can um, you can have the bonded, like you can buy insurance so that if they do steal from you, um, an insurance company will cover the theft. There's different things that you can do, but you are running a risk in a small business when you have one person doing more than one activity. Okay, so talking about cash receipts specifically, um, we can receive cash in person or we can receive it by mail or we can receive it electronically. And what we have to do is we have to keep track of all of the different cash and making sure that it makes it to its destination safely. So if we receive cash, then we might put it into some kind of lockbox and then we may have someone drive it to the bank for a nightly deposit, that kind of thing. So the cash register is an important tool. And when we do this in class, we talk a lot about like different people that work at different cash um, registers and like what does the drawer start at at Quick Trip versus Walmart and what kinds of things will make the drawer open versus not make the drawer open. Um, do know that the cash register keeps track of the sales internally. And so there's an internal tape and an external tape. The external tape goes to the customer as a receipt. The internal tape keeps track of what should be in the register. And then at the end of the shift, you count down the drawer and you compare the two and see if you have the right amount of cash in the drawer. So um, deposit slips are used to deposit cash. And you can also use like a cash receipt pre-list where you make a list of all of it. If your bank account is short or over on money, then what you do is um, you have a separate T account. So this is a brand new T account called Cash Short and Over, and it is reported on the income statement as either miscellaneous expense or miscellaneous revenue. So it comes in, like if you have extra money in your drawer at the end of the shift, then officially you have extra money and that's considered revenue. Or if you're short a few dollars, that's an expense. So when I worked at a bank here in town, um, one of my jobs was to keep track of all of the bank tellers cash short and over accounts. So I was looking for trends. And so if one teller was always short, that's a problem. If they were short and then the next day they were long and those two numbers canceled out, then that wasn't a problem. That was just a paperwork issue. So it was something that I kept track of to look for trends to make sure that people weren't doing unethical things. Or I can't make sure, but to double check and kind of pay attention to it. All right, cash received by mail. Um, when people send their money, like if I get a bill in the mail from my doctor's office, I normally just pay through electronic methods like online bill pay, but you can actually send them a check in the mail. And when you do that, you usually include what's called a remittance advice. And a remittance advice is that piece that you tear off of the bill and you stick it in the envelope with your check to make sure that the right person's account gets um, gets credited for the bill. So gets adjusted for the bill. So um, normally when you have checks in your possession, you'll stamp them on the back with for deposit only with a certain bank account so that if a check gets dropped on the way that it can't be stolen. Um, as far as cash received electronically, most of the money received electronically will come in through um, an electronic fund transfer type thing. Um, we can also pay our employees using an electronic fund transfer and directly deposit money into people's bank accounts. Um, a lot of transactions happen that way now. So you would want to match up and you would need to do entries for anything that's showing up on your bank account that's electronic. Okay. So a when we pay bills, when we pay bills, and so we just talked about cash received by cash, mail, electronically, we can also pay bills the same way. And that's where the EFT thing will come in down here. But we are going to use a system to keep um, to make to keep track of our bills that we pay very carefully. And that's called a voucher system. So a voucher system is going to be a system we use to make sure that when we pay bills, we're paying the right bills. So as an example, if I order 14 lawnmowers, like maybe I am a John Deere implement sales place, right? And I order 14 lawnmowers and then I receive 11. And then the company sends me a bill for 14. 
I don't want to pay for 14. I only got 11. So I need to compare what I ordered. I ordered 14. What I received, I received 11. And then the bill, which was for 14. And then I need to adjust the bill to only pay for what I received. So that's an important process. So we request goods that are ordered with a purchase requisition. And that's that's how you do the request. Requisition means request. So this is when, like if I at Friends University need a new computer, I can't just call up Dell and be like, what up Dell, it's me, Nicole, Get, send me a new computer. I would have to say, hey, help desk people, my computer's broken, I need a new one. And that would be a purchase requisition. I would say, I require a purchase. And then the help desk people would order the goods and then they would receive them. So the, the goods would be received. And then from there, they get a bill and then we pay the bill. But all of those things require different documentation. So we have receiving reports when we receive goods. When we get the invoice before we pay the bill, we're gonna compare what we ordered versus what we received versus the bill and only pay for what we actually received. And so those control principles, the five control principles are kind of outlined there. So when we pay employees using electronic funds transfer, um, that's called direct deposit. And most of you probably get your paychecks that way, where your bank just um, is directly putting the money into your bank account, your company is putting it directly in there. So an impress system is when we have a special account, like a special bank account, just for a specific task, like payroll. So as an example, if Friends University's payroll for the month of August, today's payday for me, um, if my payroll, um, if the payroll for the whole university is $123,000, then what they do is they put $123,000 in the payroll account, and then they write paychecks out of the payroll account. So that if an account, if, if one check is missing, they know it's a payroll check versus whatever. And if somebody were to alter a paycheck, it would make that account overdraw and they would be immediately notified that there's something wrong with the payroll stuff. So, okay. So the last topic that we need to cover in this chapter is bank reconciliations. So bank reconciliations is when we reconcile a bank account. So to reconcile means to bring something together. So if two friends are fighting, then they reconcile, they bring, they come together. So reconciling a bank account is bringing together the bank's records and the book's records. And so what the bank says you have for money and what you think as the company you have for money, bringing them together. So this is a bank reconciliation is this blank. And so what we will do is we will compare the bank statement to our cash T account. And we may have errors, we may have time lags. So this is called the deposit in transit. So if I make a deposit today, today it happens to be August 31. If I make a deposit today, then it will potentially not clear the bank until the September paycheck. So I'm sorry, I need to text tour until I may need an extra 10 minutes. I'm bad at this. Okay, so um, a deposit in transit is a timing issue where if you make a deposit, it might not show up till the next month. Um, the other side of that, sometimes you write checks and they don't clear till the next month and that's called an outstanding check. So an outstanding check is a check that you've written. It hasn't cleared the bank yet. And so for a lot of my traditional age students, they're like writing checks, what is that? And they don't even know because they don't write checks. So um, my daughter's 15 and she has a bank account, but she doesn't even have checks if she wanted to write a check. Um, but I still write checks sometimes. Um, specifically, I usually write them for things like school pictures or, or weird things like that. So um, if you write a check, sometimes it takes a while for the person to cash it. And those are called outstanding checks. Um, other things that will affect your bank reconciliation, if you get your bank statement and there's some service charges on it, then you didn't know about it until you got your bank statement. Um, if some money got electronically transferred from your customers, you might not know about that. And then another topic is called NSF checks. So NSF checks are non-sufficient funds and non-sufficient funds is, re is referring to 
when um, you deposit money in your bank account, but then the person who gave you the money doesn't have enough money in the account to pay it. So then they remove the money from your bank account. So it happened to me a couple different times in my lifetime. So as as a 44 year old, I have experienced this where I made a deposit. Somebody gave me a gift type check, right? Of like $50. It was, to be honest, it wasn't a gift for me. So I had a student who got a check from his grandma and his grandma, like he didn't have a bank account. So he's like, can I just sign this? Like, I don't know what to do. I need to cash this check. I don't bank here. And I'm like, how much is it? And he's like, it's 50 bucks. And I'm like, I have 50 bucks in my purse. Just endorse the back of it give it to me and I'll give you $50 and I'll just deposit it in my account. And he's like, okay. So like three weeks later, um, I get this notice from the bank and the check bounced. And I was like, oh crap. So I went back to the student and I was like, hey, that check from your grandma, like it bounced. And he's like, oh, she got mad at me and she put a stop pay on it. And I was like, oh, okay, well then you owe me 50 bucks. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll pay you. And he never did. So that's an NSF. So they took the 50 bucks. I deposited the 50 in my bank account. I thought I had 50 bucks in there. When that check bounced, they removed the 50 from my account. So lesson learned, right? So um, so let's go ahead and let's look at how to actually prepare a bank reconciliation. So that's the next thing we need to do here. I hate when my stuff doesn't show up. Here we go. Let's just do that. There we go. Okay. So what we're going to do is we are going to do a bank reconciliation for the month of July 31. Now I want to point out to you that this is not a financial statement. So bank reconciliations are not financial statements. They do have a who, what, when, but this is not a document we publish for our investors. And so this is an internal document. So when you do a bank reconciliation, this will be a good solid example of one. Um, the first thing you do is you compare what the bank thinks you have for money to what you think you have for money. So the bank thinks we have, so balance per bank, they think we have 96.10. That's what the bank thinks we have for money. Now we, based on our cash T account, so balance per the books, we think we have 74.30. And so if those two numbers matched, we're done. And we're like, yay, we're reconciled, everything's good. But usually they won't match. So we have outstanding checks. Now, when I'm trying to figure out what side to put things on, like what columns to put them in, I've got a bank side and a book side. And when I'm trying to do this, I ask myself the question, like, who doesn't know about it? Who doesn't know about it? So the bank does not know about my outstanding checks. I know about them because I wrote them. I'm aware, but the bank doesn't. And so when they clear the bank, when they make it to the bank, it will make my balance go down. Okay. Also, we have a check mailed for deposit that hadn't reached the bank yet. So this is called a deposit in transit. And so when it gets to the bank, the bank doesn't know about it right now. As of July 31, the bank didn't know. But when it gets there, my balance will go up by $500. So to be honest, the only things that should go on the bank statement side are these items. Unless the bank makes a mistake, this is the only stuff that goes on the bank side because every, every other adjustment should be on the book side. So we have an NSF check. And so NSF checks, like that check, it was from a customer for payment on account. They are gonna remove that from my bank account. I thought I had this 281, but that check bounced and they removed it from my account. So NSF checks are always subtracted from the book side. We also earn some interest and that will increase our balance. And then we have two errors. Now I will tell you that on your homework and stuff, I'm not giving you any errors, but I wanted you to be exposed to them. So I put them in your notes, but we will not have any errors when it comes to it. So when we come to, it comes to the actual like exam questions or quiz questions or um, homework. Okay. Check number 781 for supplies expense cleared the bank for 240, but was erroneously recorded in the books at 268. Okay, so first I need to know who made the mistake so I can figure out what side to put it on. I love the word erroneously. I think that's a fun word. Erroneously recorded in the books. Okay, so that means it's a book mistake. So we'll put error over here. And we thought we wrote a check for 268. 
We erroneously recorded in the book a check for $268. So if you paid a bill and you thought you spent $268, but you actually only spent $240, it clears the bank for $240, then you are better off because you thought you spent $268, but you really only spent $240. So the difference is $28. And so the difference is the amount of your error. So you actually thought you had 7430, but when you looked at the checks you wrote, you thought you wrote a check for 268, and it was only 240. And then the other one says a deposit by Acme. Is that us? Are we Acme? No, we're Matrix. Okay. Erroneously credited by the bank. I use that wording on purpose because the bank uses the word debits and credits kind of backwards. Um, and that's because from their standpoint, it is backwards, but I don't want to get into that. So Acme made a deposit but they put it in our account. It's like a present. It's like a gift from God, right? So we're looking at our bank statement and it says we have 9610 and we're like, boom, we're rich, right? But when we dig in there, we find this $486 that does not belong to us. All right. So we have two choices. We can sit on it and hope for the best or we can call the bank like good humans and tell them you accidentally deposited money in our bank account and it is not ours, okay? So they are probably going to notice on their own because Acme is going to notice that their $486 is missing. So somebody's going to notice. And so don't think you're going to be able to keep it because you probably won't. So we need to call up the bank and say that 486 is not ours. Please take it away. Okay. So after we get to the bottom of the bank, the bank reconciliation, we should be reconciled. These two numbers columns should be the same. So this is called the adjusted balance. And what we need to do is we need to pull up our calculator and we need to do 9610 minus 2417 plus 500 minus 486. So I got 7207 as my adjusted balance. And then from there, I need to look at the other side and I do 7430 minus 281 plus 30 plus 28, 7207. And when those two numbers match, we are reconciled. We have reconciled. So the other thing you have to do when you do bank recs is you have to go ahead and do journal entries because these items are things that we did not know about until we got our bank statement. So we actually need to record these items. Our cash T account is showing a balance of 7430. It should, I should write adjusted balance over here too. Um, it should be 7207. This is the correct balance after I make these corrections. So I need to do three journal entries. So when I do these three journal entries, um, each one of these entries is gonna involve cash because I'm fixing my bank account. I'm fixing my cash account. So this one is a minus to cash. I don't know what the debit is yet, but I know it's 281. The next one is positive cash. Don't know the, the, the other side. And it's $30. And the last one is positive cash. And it's $28. So I basically have the journal entries done and I haven't even really done anything yet. Knowing that each one of these is going to impact cash because I'm fixing my cash account and knowing whether cash went up or down. So NSF checks, NSF checks, those customers, we're going to try to collect our money from them. We're going to go hunt them down and try to get our money. So NSF checks always go in accounts receivable. The interest will go in interest revenue. And the error, it depends on what the error is about. So the $28 error was related to, and it'll always tell you. So it might say accounts payable, and it might say supplies. This one says supplies expense. So I'm going to adjust supplies expense. So that's it for bank recs. So I've got one more that I'm going to go ahead and put together. I'd like you to hit pause and I'd like you to try to do it by yourself and see if you can adjust this bank account. So let me go ahead and do this one. So after you've hit pause, now hit pause and then come back to me. Let's do it. So balance per bank, 5586. Balance per books, 5055. Outstanding checks are always minus on this side because the bank doesn't know about it. 
deposits in transit are always added to this side because the bank doesn't know about it. NSFs are always subtracted from the books and interest is added to the books. And then I have a couple of errors. Again, you won't have errors on your homework or project or anything like that. All right, and payment of accounts payable. Cleared the bank for 1100, but it was erroneously recorded in the books at 800. So I thought I spent 800, but I actually spent 1100. So that's gonna be minus 300 over here. And then this deposit in the amount of 5,600 recorded properly on the books. So that error is on this side, erroneously credited on the bank same for 5,800. Okay, so 5,600 is the right number. They accidentally deposited money in our account for 58. So that is an extra 200. And so we need to call and tell them to get rid of that 200 because that 200 does not belong to us. Inside of this number, there's a deposit for 5,800. It should have been 56. So adjusted balance, let's check that. 5586 minus 1816 plus 750 minus 200. I have 4320 and Forty three twenty, and then I need my adjusting entries, my um, my bank reconciliation adjustments. So again, I adjust for stuff over here. These are the things that we don't know about. So we need adjustments over there. So hit pause and record them. All right, let's go through them. So again, this each one involves cash. This uh, entry is for four fifty. This entry is for 15. This entry is for 300. This one is a deposit to cash. And this one is minus in cash. So I don't know that account. Uh, this one is the interest revenue. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in. NSFs, we try to collect that. We wanna receive that in the future. So that's accounts receivable. And then the 300 is an error, and I need to know what the error relates to in payment of accounts payable. So the other side of that is accounts payable. All right, so that is it for chapter five. I'm going to have a separate video where I'm going to help you with one of the tabs of chapter five homework. So there's only three tabs of chapter five homework. So um, chapter five homework will go pretty quickly, just like the notes went pretty quickly. So I hope you guys are doing well, and I will talk to you later. Bye.